So what you see here uh, did not exist in anywhere else than our thoughts by 1st of February. So we've had a lot of people run really fast to make things uh, work out. So the Farm of Ideas is connected to uh, the restaurants in the Relay community. So we have Relay, Manfred's Based and Mirabel that sort of uh, uh, are supplied with the, uh, with the vegetables uh, from here. Down there you see uh, our herd of cows. Svenholm also have 120 cows, a slightly big operation over on the other side. But these are ours and they supply us with uh, uh, raw milk every day that is uh, uh, brought to Based where we make fresh cheese daily. So we make mozzarella, ricotta, mascarpone, various types of cheeses based on the raw milk that we do here. This is something very, very, very special because you're not allowed to make raw milk cheeses in Denmark. You're not allowed to serve raw milk. You're not allowed to eat raw milk. You can barely think about raw milk without breaking some laws. And uh, we uh, started doing this because I found a little uh, a very uh, important loophole, so to say, in the, in the legislation a few years ago where they opened up uh, the idea of restaurants being able to use raw milk if you would pasteurize it yourself. So uh, until then we had base going on for a couple of years and we would just buy in milk from uh, Tise or Ulingo in different periods, we tried different things. Uh, and made fresh cheese there, but I realized that if we could get the milk raw and just pasteurize it in-house, then we could uh, 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 start on a very much more interesting path in terms of the, of the cheese making. Because uh, um, when you do a mozzarella, I don't know how many of you have a, a cheese making experience, but when you make cheese, you run the cheese, you ferment the curd. The curd is the, the solid part of the milk. You know, once the liquid goes off, you have something that then can be transformed into a thousand different types of cheeses. That is called the curd, and the curd ferments often, and it gets to a lower and lower acidity. And at one point, the acidity is so low that if you heat this, it starts melting, turning into a dough, or as I like to say, it's absolutely magic because you have the calcium that can sort of release from the proteins and it becomes liquid. Exactly like the mozzarella looks when you have it melting on a pizza in the oven, but that's the second time that that melts. So when you do that, you do it in hot water. And my thought was, well, if you do it in hot water, then you're pasteurizing the cheese. So we started measuring the temperature of the, uh, uh, of the process. And we could see that technically we could justify that this was being pasteurized now. So if this was a possibility, we could start getting raw milk in ourselves and start processing it there. So to call uh, a dairy that has, uh, I don't know how many thousands of hectoliters of milk coming through every day and tell them that you want 100 or 200 liters that needs to be completely outside of the system and they need to do a completely different logistical uh, nightmare with the uh, risk and hazard uh, analysis and all these things, we can just forget about it. Uh, just a question. It, it, I, I thought that Arla Unica does have some uh, raw milk products. Yes, we'll get back to that. Okay. Uh, when, when, we, uh, uh, when I thought that this was a possibility, I also realized that since we don't need to get this pasteurized under some controlled uh, system we can just get it in straight from the cow so in my uh, deranged mind that very fast became that then we can have our own cows so we got eight jersey cows in 2016 with the purpose of harvesting the milk to bring it straight to the uh, to the <coughs> restaurant and start processing it there uh, in terms of the Alla Unica cheeses, I can't remember all the procedures, but to me uh, it's very symptomatic that the only 
way that you can create a, a, a raw milk cheese in this uh, country is when the biggest, biggest, biggest economy in dairy has the money to invest in a research and development project that has no commercial purpose besides a branding uh, uh, project to do the craziest work in terms of risk analysis and whatever you need to live up to to be able to prove that this is fine uh, and to make a cheese that is very inclusive and does not really benefit anyone. To me what is the key about the raw milk cheese production is exactly the independence in it because we don't need a big dairy production we don't need to go through a big dairy to be able to create something that is crafted of a very high level and to me the incentives behind having your cows pasture in one way or another or choosing one type of breed that might give you a less lesser yield but a higher quality the incentive needs to be in what do you get of economy out of your milk in the end so if you can do like what we do which is that we keep the value of this milk in-house until the most expensive time to sell it, which is on a plate in a restaurant, then we can actually do something where all these things make a difference. If you as a young farmer, you would like to start experimenting with this and try to make a cheese that can be absolutely unique of the highest quality for a high price, you're not allowed to do the things that will actually make a difference for you. So the raw milk discussion to me is very, very, very important and very, very interesting. But what we are trying to do mainly is to start breaking into this little uh, world of allowing this to become a possibility that we can use. So that's the cows. Now we have, uh, we had eight and then uh, uh, biology and the need for milk sort of... Uh, gives you a calf and then another calf and then now there's more than 40 so uh, uh, that's a it's, a it's a it's a little bit too much but um, we're trying to sort out how to to deal with these things we have many many things to learn in that sense too but what you see there is a mobile milking system next to the tractor and the cows are milked there twice a day and the uh, the milking system can sort of fo follow them around on the pasture so if they will be moved earlier this year they were over on the other side and the milking system was over there and we just try and keep them out the entire time, all the time. When we were in the old location, we had to fight for three years to not build a stable. Because, again, this is another uh, incredible uh, uh, idiosyncrasy in this world, that if you want to do something that is very, very simple, of the highest quality, there's so many people ready to stop you from what you're doing. Because you might end up doing something too good, maybe. That must be the, the, the fear. Uh, we wanted to avoid building a stable. We started thinking about what if we did a beautiful, uh, uh, open, almost glass house that these cows could be in. It would just be a glass roof where they could be in the winter to just be a little bit uh, screened off. And then all the nutrients that will go into the ground, we would use the in the summer period where they will not be in there and start growing tomatoes in, the, in this glass house and pick up the nutrients again and have a closed loop system that would be absolutely wonderful and none of it was legal. <laughs> we couldn't build the stable there because of Denmark's uh, Natur, Fuzzling for Eating, which is uh, uh, taking care of the uh, environment, uh, the natural environment, I guess you can say, and they would uh, thought that this was not an appropriate place for a stable. The stable needs to be in the where the buildings are, but the buildings that we had were not zoned for having agriculture, so you couldn't have cows where the buildings were. There was a stable there that we could put the cows in, but the stable was not uh, adapted for organic agriculture, so we couldn't have the cows in there if they're supposed to be organic. So we couldn't have them outside either because they have to be in a stable. So we had to pour out for more than 100,000 krona concrete into the fields for this to work out because they were afraid that the pollution from having these cows on the spot will cause a problem. This is also things that you have to remember that there's people sitting in offices with some numbers that they calculate and if you tell them there's a dairy cow then there's a figure and that's the pollution and this is not legal. They, they cannot uh, understand or discuss the nuances in maybe we will do a different system where they will not pollute as much because there will not be as many as them and we would have to experiment with some things where we could uh, pick up the nutrients again or something. All that is just too abstract for anybody to understand. And the easiest thing when it comes to food is just to say it's illegal. Mm. We want startups, we want innovation, we want new businesses. But if you try and do that in agriculture, you are uh, uh, a criminal just to start off.
somehow you're in it to hurt people. That's the, that's the principle. Anyhow, the farm of ideas is exactly that as a purpose. It is uh, trying to make an umbrella where we can have many activities that can try and bring gastronomy and agriculture together to, to fight for better food all the time. I think that we have a, a, a possibility and a responsibility to bring uh, the agricultural side a little bit more forward and have it be a little bit under the attention and under the limelight that we have so much on ourselves in terms of chefs and restaurants at the time. And uh, I have an enormous fascination for the produce, the raw material behind all the food that we do. And I'm always trying to have our food be as simple as possible. And uh, you will see that there's some produce here that you will see later that to me proves the point that if you have a cutting board and you have the right produce, you uh, essentially have a restaurant. No? And this is again to me, if you want to have innovation, you need to be able to give some dispensation to it. Yeah. How can you make a case for an alternative way of doing it if it's done illegal before you even try it? Yeah. You know, and this, there's just many, many things that are very difficult to discuss. And when you have to do with farming, you have to do with zoning laws, the health department, the uh, organic association and the criteria for the organic association and the uh, Denmark's natural farming spring, like there's so many th things that are very difficult for you to navigate. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very complicated. Uh, as you describe it, it's like a sort of resistance against this technocracy and stuff. But are you alone in this, or there is like a larger movement of uh, farmers uh, trying to do things in order to make them? Uh, I don't know if there's, I don't, I don't. It's hard for me to say whether uh, there's a movement. I think that uh, uh, I work by uh, having some opinions and uh, asking myself some questions and trying to find the answers. And I work for uh, trying to, if there's something that is absolutely fucked up, I think it's important to talk about it. No? So when we get into this process, when you go from being in cooking to go into seeing, okay, if I want better produce, what do I do? And then you start seeing how, how it's made difficult for you to actually make great produce. Then I start questioning what, it is, what kind of system is behind this. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I think we are, we are misled today with this idea and this premise of uh, being a high risk involved in all foods, which I think is, uh, is, uh, uh, is an illusion that is uh, uh, created by an extremely industrialized system that is also having the consumers be so alienated towards the food that they eat that they actually believe the food is dangerous. It doesn't make any sense. Food's not dangerous. You are made to eat food every day and survive. So there's many, many things in us that I think we could use in a, in a better way. And I think that uh, if you want to find some serious solution to climate issues, you need to have pleasure and gastronomy as a part of the solution. For me, thinking that uh, uh, we can find a way uh, with uh, fake burgers and things that look like hot dogs but are not, this is not a solution. This is giving even more power to the very industrialized system that has put us in the shit to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that young farmers and young people in food have room to develop and bring their values to the work that they do and bring things forward. And I think that that is creating a movement because I'm sure there's a lot of people that have similar thoughts, but I don't see an organized movement towards this today. I have been very, very lucky because I've been involved and um, invited into several political discussions with the uh, city hall, the Copenhagen commune, with the organic associations, with political lobbies and stuff like this, because I try and speak, uh, uh, speak this case of, uh, of food needing to be good. That's the, that's the cows. Uh, we obviously also slaughter uh, some cows and use the meat in the restaurants. And then we have two hectares here uh, that are uh, our vegetable patch. So we have two hectares of so-called market gardening style uh, agriculture. You can see from high above, you can see that there is a garden. There's 26, 27 gardens of uh, uh, 16 beds of 80 centimeters times 20 meters. That's a lot of numbers, but you can see them essentially here. It's a very intensive type of agriculture, which sounds negative, but the point is you don't need to walk too far <laughs> because if you do things handheld without big machinery, you want to have things as close as possible and have them as intensely 
uh, grown in a close space as possible. That has several benefits. The more you can have things grow together, the less you need to deal with the, with the weeds, because when you grow any sort of plant, your purpose is to make this plant win in the big battle for nutrients, light, and what is going on in the soil. You have a shitload of things ready to take up everything you put in the soil, or everything that is ready in the soil, everything comes from above, and you, your purpose is to try and set this up in a way where you win and your plants win. So what you will see in this uh, first tunnel here, is our nursery where you have small um, small flats of small plants that we make ourselves. Estelle, could you, or Kelly, could you get a flat with uh, some plants? Just the one from yesterday, maybe the parsley or something? Just so we can show. <coughs> uh, we prepare the beds in several ways. As you can see, there's some plastic laying on there. And then you're like, oh, plastic is not good. The turtles see all that stuff. But plastic is really good here because what you do is you, you put it on top for about uh, somewhere between three and six weeks. And this allows for all the weeds to sort of die. You warm up the soil a little bit. And uh, uh, we open this up and are ready to plant out the small plants in an environment where everybody else is behind. So you make a small plant, you give it already the two, three weeks head start, and you put it in the ground at a time where there's no competition. Then you hope that this can grow fast enough to be able to keep its lead in the competition and that's essentially how you, you, you try and win this battle. You try and cultivate which means just essentially when you see small little bastards coming up you try and get rid of those while they're still not too strong to fight the fight and then hopefully the weeding is uh, as little as possible because again this is very much manual labor. When you go, uh, when you use a more industrialized system you, um, when you use a more industrialized system, you have more tractors just running through and they will cultivate with these strings that they can sort of pick up things. But here we need to do things primarily by hand, which is a lot of work. So as you can see here, small plants that are then put out. And this is the paper pot, but here you can see also a little root system that we then put to the ground and start growing. We have hundreds of different varieties of vegetables here. Uh, on the two hectares, we're spreading out like crazy. The purpose here is to say <coughs> diversity is what we want. This is what we want to uh, experience. This is what we want to uh, see if we can develop as much as possible. This is what we need for the restaurant. So the main criteria for this farm setup that is very different than any other is that we don't need to find a market because we are the market as in the restaurants are already buying this before it's even grown it's gonna happen no matter what so that gives us many uh, advantages that you otherwise would not have because you would have to as a farmer obviously be dependent on what the customer wants and all these things I believe that restaurants has an enormous an enormous responsibility in doing this because today you have people going to restaurants with a much more open mind than they go to a supermarket or to a market. If you go to a market and you 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 find a crazy tomato, let's see if I can find something here. Excuse me. Like if you go to a market and you find this, then no one has a clue what to do. What is this? Can you boil this? Can you cook this? Can you roast this? Da -da -da. And if you have a, a limited cooking experience, then you're afraid that you can ruin it because somehow this can, uh, 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 I don't know, explode in your hands and kill you or something like this. <laughs> but uh, if you have cooking experience, you obviously just start trying out and see what you can do. And this is why I think there's, there's, there's a potential in being able to, as a restaurant, work as a translator between what is in the nature, what is in agriculture, and what is on the plate because people are very much having a hard time making that link themselves and that's why i think we as restaurants have a, a both a responsibility but also an opportunity to show people so while you as a, a regular farmer would have a really hard time understanding who sh who, who's going to buy this and how am i going to explain this to people that they should buy it we can just say oh you know i heard about this uh, patterson squash uh, let's let's make it. How, okay, how many do we make? Well, let's make 200 kilos. And then these 200 kilos will be forced upon a restaurant to sort out what to do with. Or maybe on a bright day and a good day, 
when I'm in a good mood, I have an idea about what to do with it. No? And then this goes and becomes a dish that then people eat in a restaurant and find amazing. And all of a sudden, maybe someone goes to the market and they see this, and they remember that this was actually something special. And then maybe they'll buy it. So we are, we are not playing the same game that everybody has to play. We allow ourselves to do things that are otherwise not possible because we are so closely connected between kitchen and farm. In the nursery here, we make almost everything uh, to small plants and then they're put out in the different beds. Now we're gonna walk through here, this greenhouse. We go to the bottom, then we turn around and we go up the other side and we end up here. And we could just walk and if you have any questions you can ask me and if you have any question Estelle is there also she is one of the gardeners out here and she can understand Kelly is here too ask some uh, questions and we'll meet up again slowly back here and we'll talk a little bit more here okay any questions before we leave I have a question, question. so I, I guess uh, the cows most of the time during the years are here yes. uh, outside of Mm -hmm. stable, then I believe that it will end up um, making high nutrition on land if you are sort of, you know, imbalance the right number of the cows and then yep. size of the land and all the stuff. What is your sort of, you know, I don't know, uh, what is your uh, wisdom or what is your guideline that how many cows in how many hectares that you are normally growing and all stuff. And then I, I guess you are moving around the cows here and there mm -hmm. and then using those nutritious farm uh, turning into the uh, growing vegetables. No, How do you know no, do no, that? No, no, no. The, the, the grazing of the cows on pasture should be a closed loop system where the nutrients that they give allow for more pasture to come back again. So as you move them around, sooner you, you will have it. The idea of having a stable where you would have to have them fixed in a smaller space that would be a much higher density of n nutrients, we would try and pick that up by growing vegetables. But we don't need it. when. When you use the cow manure to spread on something, it's because they're in a stable. The point here is that they're moving around and they are fertilizing the soil that they're on, which will eventually give grass back. Yeah, then uh, how many cows will be? Normally, as a yeah. rule of point, you have one cow per hectare. Okay. For, for, for the spread of a year. Yeah, and, and uh, you've chosen Jersey cows. One time? Other, you've chosen, that is Jersey cows, right? Uh, there's a big mix. There's okay. a, there's, it's mainly Jersey cows. We have some red Danish, uh, the, the, the Danish heritage race, and then we have uh, some crosses of Holstein and Jersey, and we have a Fjellko bull, which is a Swedish hybrid breed, that we have then crossed <laughs> with some of them. So then it's, I can't even tell you what the race then becomes. So it's a, it's a big mix. And there's a huge difference regarding the taste, and what is your preference? What, what, what? It's, it's something that is so complex that we have not uh, come to any conclusions yet. We're just trying to see how can we set up something that is satisfying for us and that can develop the best possible milk. It is very, very difficult also to do things where you want to do the holistic grazing. You want to uh, try and get to milking once a day to have as high quality milk as possible because also the many, many um, breeds of cow that you find I bred towards a completely different system. So it's very difficult to start milking once a day, which we tried for a period of time, because simply the cows just can't, like they need to get rid of the milk. They mm. produce too much. But why would it be better to milk just once a day? A natural cow is, well, the, 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 well a, a calf would drink the entire day, so I would yep. only milk one, one time a day. Well, you could maybe do something where you milk the cow once a day and then you leave the calf for the rest, no? Yeah, okay. So that's, that's what you try and do. And also what we have to try and consider here is the, uh, a conventional system, organic or not, but the, the normal system has one way of doing it, where you have a big stable and you have some staffing, you have a lot of machinery, you do all these things. But we try and get 150, 200, 250 liters of milk a day, which is a completely different setup. So if we could have something where we just milk once a day, it would be half the workload for us. And our 150 liters or, two liter or 200 liters of milk, that's an enormous difference in terms of cost. So there's also some of these things that we try and understand. How can we have as little input uh, as possible and then accept a lesser output, no? That's the same tomatoes, but they come in different shapes and sizes, very 
different than speckled ramen, mainly used for confit right now. Like we get them in the oven with some olive oil and salt and half cooked, semi dry kind of. Then green zebra, indigo rose, which is quite funny, it takes quite a long time for them to ripe. So they're at the beginning, they're green on the bottom and black around. And then there was the last tomatoes getting ripe, so they be when they become red on the bottom, then they're ready, really nice, and get smoky when you cook them a little bit. Then that's my favorite one, the Lucky Tiger. It's green, but it actually is very surprisingly sweet, so it's really, really nice. Then we've got the San Marzano, which is mainly used for sauces, so more it has more flesh than juice. So it's maybe not the most tasty one when you eat it just like that, but it's nice to cook for sauces. And then brandy wine, another beef uh, variety, the black cream, and then that's also the green. Yeah, green zebra is here. Then we've got different types of cucumbers, the arola, which is the most, the, the one that looks like the most uh, like supermarket one, but the restaurant keep on liking it. So. Then Corinto, <coughs> we've got some other Adam Gherkins for people, and that's like the winner of the year, the crystal apple. I don't recommend to eat the skin, so I would just bite it like uh, the, the flesh inside, and it has a lot of seeds, but it's very juicy and crunchy, so that was a very good surprise this year. Then salt and pepper, also thick skin, but nice crunch inside. And then we've got a lot of uh, zucchini, sunburst, also one of the winner of the year. It's look almost the same, those two patisons, sunburst and G-star, but the sunburst seems more like sweet and they just like it more. The zephyr has more like a dense meat inside, so they're also not... It's so not a big winner. It looks pretty, but it's <coughs> not the most flavorful. So maybe just to find another use of it. The Magda, a bit bumpy one. Cocozelle, Serafina, Tromboncino, very fun one. You can make necklace with it. <laughs> Earrings. <laughs> Earrings and things. Many different types. There is a knife close by, so if something is not chopped up, you can just yeah. so try. Yeah, so try a piece of tomato, try a piece of cucumber, see what you... What's your what favorite? You think? And if you have any questions now, it's about time for the last questions because then we will finish up. Before we get started with the questions, sorry, I just want to uh, be uh, just slightly commercial for one second. <laughs> there is a hill up there where there's a bar, and if you from the hill look into the forest, there's an opening in the forest, and in the opening, the picnic is set up. So we have five brilliant chefs today uh, preparing a picnic for people that you get a basket you have a blanket in your basket and you get the food from the five different chefs that are in the tent over there you take it with you to the bar you sit on the hill you look at the cows you philosophize over all your life and you eat beautiful food while you sit on a blanket and that's great if you're interested in doing so you can walk up there to the bar and you can buy a ticket for the for the picnic there's a few tickets left and it's a great opportunity for you to listen to jazz and hear some nice music questions we are just I'm so happy you asked because we started a compost system like five days ago and it's down there and we're trying to 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 see to because it's simple to put all the, all your scraps here in one place, right? That's essentially composting. But from then on, to have a little bit more of an organized approach to it yeah. is, is a little bit more complicated. And what I really hope that we can do is that we can have the vegetable scraps from the restaurant to come out here and be composted out here. But there's something that takes some steps. I've uh, <laughs> yes, I found I found some uh, uh, interest in uh, bokashi composting that I don't know much about, but I know that it might be the solution that we need. To, uh, uh, it's essentially a fermentation of uh, vegetable scraps that you do uh, locally in the restaurants and then bring it out here and, and then finish the composting here. That's what I hope for. Uh, I, if we have to, we'll do it. If we'll do something special, we'll do it. Reality is, I can buy a liter of organic tomato sauce for two kroner. So if it's something that I put on a pizza, 
of a brilliant quality. I don't know how much better quality I need to do to get on my knees yeah. and do tomatoes ourselves. So we have There's to be real. Producers. Huh? There's enough good producers. Yes, yes, yes. What, what we try and do with this is we do an extra effort, but we need to make sure that people understand we do an extra effort. If you put that in a sauce, it's very difficult for people to understand. Reality is not a lot of people will be able to taste the difference. I also made the point with one of the cherry tomatoes there. Is the cherry bomb there somewhere or no? No. Okay. Yeah, if you have if you have a, a cherry tomato that potentially could be the best tasting tomatoes that you can find and you grow it here and we put a lot of effort in growing it ourselves and then we put it in the restaurant and you put a cherry tomato on a plate people that eat at the restaurant that also tend to go to a supermarket and see that there's a cherry tomato for them to understand that there's an enormous difference between the one that they see in the supermarket and the one they see on the plate it's very 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 difficult and very few people are capable of doing it but if I cut one of the uh, striped German tomatoes lengthwise across and you have a beautiful yellow orange speckled tomato that people have never seen before in their life they understand immediately that this is something special and that's much easier to taste the difference once you know that this is something special that's just the reality so to do it in a sauce is something that we have talked about and discussed to do something special where um, uh, when Estelle was uh, oh, too many tomatoes so then we start uh, doing something because we tried to do uh, a yellow tomato sauce with uh, some of the uh, yellow ones not the striped German the other one Sack uh, because that could be something very special then we could make a pizza with a yellow tomato sauce man th this is already something that you know people would think about what what is what is going on with this thing no we also did the marinara uh, pizza which is just tomato with stracciatella on top that we put and and garlic but instead of putting a tomato sauce we just come feed the samazano tomatoes and just put them on top almost whole but very intense in flavor and was absolutely outstanding no so we need to have get the most out of everything that we do Doing tomato sauce is always a part. Yeah, I can't put salad it. Yeah, me too. It's, you know, yeah. end of all those things. Yeah, yeah. This as a family thing. And it's, uh, but there's a big difference between doing things for your own for pleasure your own and for, for something that you can finance also. <coughs> yeah, any more questions? Yes? I was asked that question <coughs> earlier also, and oh, uh, no, no, but uh, for, from another person. Um, and uh, we, the idea is not to be self-sustainable. I think self-sustainable is, uh, is, is not something that makes sense when you have a number of restaurants. It makes sense if you are all on your own and you want to be self-sustainable for other purposes. What I think is important is that we're not trying to make an exclusive project where we sort of uh, uh, cut the link to the people that have brought us where we are today with the farming that they've done. So for us it's important that we do this not to make our own vegetables, but to learn from making our own vegetables and to discover many things in the process of it. Which means that at times like now, with such a bounty, we have more vegetables than we can use, which is good. But in the winter time, where the stuff that you use is more of the root vegetables and stuff that are normally made a little bit more bulk that we do much less of here, then we buy much more from other people. Yeah, well, it's, to me, it's a, it's more to consider that we don't do carrots. Okay. Like we don't do carrots. The carrots we buy from Sven Holm because they're here. So we have a, uh, that's a part of the collaboration with Sven Holm too, that we can start having a discussion about things that we don't necessarily grow either. So corn they do and. Uh, the carrots they do and they do beets and potatoes and stuff like this that we don't want to focus on as of now and then we just have that discussion there. but we've had again the purpose is not when we when we started this it wasn't because we had to grow carrots because nobody was growing carrots plenty of people grow carrots but there's a big difference between taking the responsibility for that process and understanding the whole thing and what it means from the seed to the harvest than it is to just buy it from someone
a stream that can stop grow here to get a quality and then we can just buy on the market? Or? Uh, the, the, there's a many steps between growing it ourselves and just buying it at the market. We have maybe 10 vegetable producers that we've had brilliant vegetables from for five, six years before we started doing our own farming. They do great quality that we then get from. But the quality that we get from them can, might be great, but there's no learnings in it. So for me, what's important is that we get some learnings in what we do here, and then the quality is assured. Like the, our base level, the, the bottom level, it's still very high. And then we have some things that become extremely special that we can be proud of. Okay, everybody, the, I think that will be the final words. Go to the bar, get your picnic, and get some drinks. And have a beautiful day. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.